There are certain scenes in the life of our Lord that are really beyond our comprehension. And surely the transfiguration was one of those. But our text today contains another. Luke 22, 39 to 46 is without doubt one of the most sacred of all biblical passages because it describes one of the greatest mysteries in all history. The measure of Christ's agony in the Garden of Gethsemane is something you and I will never fully understand this side of eternity. Luke gives it in a very simple and straightforward manner, one that is more abbreviated than any of the other synoptics. And yet he provides a very profound description of the of the depth of the affliction of the soul of our Lord in his humanity. Now, I can't improve on Hendrickson's introduction to this passage, so let me just quote it. He wrote, The beloved physician must have been deeply moved when he described what occurred in Gethsemane, or as he simply calls the place, the Mount of Olives. He abbreviates, making no mention of the eight disciples who were left at the garden's gate, and of the three, Peter, James, and John, who accompanied Jesus into the grove, nor of the three separate prayers and the Savior's return each time to the three disciples always finding them sleeping. On the other hand, it is Luke alone who mentions the angel who came to strengthen Jesus. It is he alone who refers to the sweat that became like thick drops of blood falling down upon the ground. It is Luke who, even more emphatically than Matthew and Mark, rivets our attention on the appalling horror to which the Savior was exposed, the frightful, soul-piercing anguish he experienced. It's easy to see that Luke's account of this event is shorter than the others, but in many ways more profound. And certainly we can learn from all the gospel accounts, but Luke provides us with some details here that the others do not. And this account helps us to understand the awesomeness of this hour. What occurred here was one of the greatest battles in human history. And it is interesting that the two greatest battles of all time both took place in a garden. In the Garden of Eden, Adam chose to disobey God, bringing sin to the human race. He did not resist temptation, but chose his own will over the Father's. In contrast to that, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, chose the Father's will over his own human will. And just as Adam's decision in Eden affected all who are related to Adam, so Christ's decision in Gethsemane affects all who are related to him by faith. But this passage is really like holy ground. We should probably take our shoes off, and I Realize many of you at home probably already have your shoes off. But what occurred here is more significant than most of us realize. As G. Campbell Morgan puts it, this story is almost too sacred to explore by the methods of exegesis or exposition. And moreover, he says, there are things in it which have defied all exposition and have baffled every exegete. 
What an awesome challenge it is as we approach this text to treat it in a way it deserves. As John MacArthur says, no matter what we read about the temptation of Christ in the garden, we are left with incalculable mystery. His experience is absolutely unique and not like anything any human being has ever experienced. We do a great disservice, disservice to this passage of Scripture when we approach it from merely human or psychological understanding. There was much more going on here in the garden than simply the dread or fear of dying. Many others have faced death, but what Jesus faced was something no one else has ever faced. Now, we're told in Isaiah 53 that the suffering servant would be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We see glimpses of that in the life of Christ. We certainly see it in the Gospel of Luke. We see his grief over sin and the consequences of sin. And there are places where we are told that he was deeply moved in his human spirit, such as in Luke 19.41, where he saw Jerusalem and wept over it. The author of Hebrews wrote, in the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. Because of his perfect obedience, God the Father raised him from the dead. But no doubt the apex of his sorrow and grief came in the Garden of Gethsemane as he poured out his soul to his Father in prayer. In fact, as Luke tells us, his sorrow was so severe it came close to killing him. And we must understand why his sorrow was so deep. This passage tells us, and we'll divide it into five parts. The first thing we see here in this text is the arrival. Look with me at verse 39. And he came out and proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples also followed him. They had been in the upper room for a long time. And after they sang a hymn, which would have been Psalm 118, the last song of the Hallel, which was the way the Jews always concluded the Passover meal, they left that place and they headed to the Mount of Olives. And according to chapter 21, verse 37, this is what they had done every night this week. It says now, during the day he was teaching in the temple, but at evening he would go out and spend the night on the mount that is called Olivet. John 18.1 gives us some additional information. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, that is the upper room discourse, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden into which he himself entered and his disciples. They went across the Kidron Valley and up onto the Mount of Olives, specifically to a place where there was a small garden, of course, the Garden of Gethsemane. It is an awesome place there in Israel. And Matthew 26, 36 says, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. But it is important to note that Jesus was not in any way trying to hide from his betrayer. John adds, now Judas also, who was betraying him, 
knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. They go right to the place where Judas would know where they were. This is a divinely appointed time. There's no need to hide from Judas. This is all part of God's plan of salvation. Jesus will be taken, but not by surprise. This is all predetermined by God. Before, when they were planning for the last Passover, they did not let Judas know where they were going because it was not yet the time. And Jesus had much he needed to do that night. But now God's time for his arrest had come. So there's no need to be deceptive in any way. They would go right to the place where Judas knew. The shepherd is now in the process of laying down his life for the sheep. We'll go on to verse 40. And when he arrived at the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Literally, this means pray that your temptation will not overwhelm you. Or pray that the temptation against you will not be successful. Jesus himself was tempted, yet he remained without sin. But he's concerned here about his disciples, that they would fall into sin as a result of their temptation. The word for temptation there may better be translated testing. They were going to go through a time of severe testing, and Jesus wanted them to be able to stand in that time of testing. In Matthew 26, 31, Jesus had warned his disciples that they were about to become the fulfillment of Zechariah 13, 7. You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. And again, we see the incredible love that Jesus had for these men. That even though he was facing his own hour of suffering, he was still concerned about them. And Satan is going to attack them to try to destroy their faith and hope, but prayer will be a protection for them to enable them to stay faithful to Christ. He has already warned Peter that Satan wants to sift him like wheat, and he has warned all of them that they are going to be severely tested when the shepherd is struck down, so they need to pray. And Jesus himself is going to pray, but he urges his followers to do the same. And yet, it is important to understand their temptation and Jesus' temptation were not the same. They were not the same at all. Their battle as sinful men was to resist sin and to walk in righteousness. Jesus' battle as the sinless Son of God was not to resist sin, but to be willing to become sin for us. In other words, their struggle was to abandon sin and to walk in holiness while Jesus' struggle was to abandon holiness and become sin. His temptation was exactly the opposite of theirs. You see, sin was completely foreign to him. It was incomprehensible to him. And yet, he would have to become sin in order to be our sin bearer. And that's what this battle was all about. He had never tasted sin. 
he is fighting against his holy impulses and repulsing at the thought of becoming sin. He was deeply grieved over the thought of bearing our sin. And that is what cost him so much agony. But at this point, he's primarily concerned with his disciples. Eight of them, according to Matthew and Mark, he left at the entrance to the garden. Three of them he takes in a little further with him. And then he goes on even further to pray alone. And that leads us to the second element, which is the affliction. Verse 41, and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray. Kneeling down was not the customary posture for prayer in those days. Jewish men would stand and would look toward heaven when they prayed. But this time, Jesus knelt. And that doesn't even tell the whole story because Matthew 26, 39 says, he fell on his face. This is the man of sorrows at his most sorrowful moment. What was it that caused him such grief and sorrow? Well, we could point to a number of different things. Certainly, he was grieved over the rejection of his beloved nation as they would not receive him as the Lord's Messiah. Certainly, he was grieved over the betrayal of one of his very own, Judas Iscariot. He may have been grieved over the dissension and the self-seeking among the eleven and certainly of the upcoming denial by Peter. And surely all those things caused sorrow to his holy soul. But that is not his primary concern. There is one thing that he dreads more than anything else, and that is the drinking of the bitter cup. Go on to verse 42 saying, and here's his prayer, Father, if thou art willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but thine be done. Remove this cup. What is the cup? That is the key to understanding the significance of Gethsemane. Theologically, there has been much discussion over the meaning of the cup and the purpose of Jesus' prayer. G. G. Campbell Morgan, for example, points out that some of the most devout Bible students are not in agreement as to what this really means. But we will never understand the depth of his love for us and the enormity of his suffering for our sake until we understand the meaning of the cup. Some believe the cup is a reference to his physical suffering and death. And they may point to the fact that at the inauguration of the first Lord's Supper that he pointed to the cup as the new covenant in his blood. Is this the cup that Jesus was praying about? here in the garden? Well, certainly there is absolutely no doubt that the cross and the events leading up to the cross involved excruciating pain. Scourging was called the little death because often the victims would die because of that horrible beating. And crucifixion itself is one of the most painful forms of execution ever devised. In fact, it is so incredibly painful that a whole new word was invented to describe the level of pain. It is the word excruciating, and that means out of the cross. Out of the cross. 
you and I cannot even begin to imagine the physical suffering and pain our Lord endured for us. But as horrible as that was, I do not believe that is what Jesus is praying about here in Gethsemane. Some might want to point to some kind of emotional pain as the cup, but I don't believe that is it either. And by the way, even though Jesus was obviously very sorrowful here in Gethsemane, and this appears to be a struggle in the inner man, we need to be very careful about over-psychologizing this passage. Many, I believe, have fallen into error here by making Jesus out to be a mere man. He was not. He was the divine son of God. He was fully man, to be sure, but he was also fully God. So we need to be careful not to assume that he was just like we would be if we were there. Was there psychological and emotional suffering as part of Jesus' experience of going to the cross? Surely in his humanity, there was. But I don't believe that is the cup that Jesus was referring to. The cup must refer to something unique to him. It must refer to something that no one else has ever suffered. Others have suffered physical torture and death. Others have suffered great emotional distress. That can't be what this is all about. This has to be something unique to him, and it is. This cup that Jesus is asking his father to remove from him is none other than the cup of God's wrath poured out on him as he became sin for us. It is the spiritual suffering of the Holy Son of God being made sin. It is the dread of being the object of God's wrath as our sin bearer. And we could go to a number of Old Testament passages that speak of the cup as the wrath of God upon sin. In Job 21.20, a wicked person is said to drink of the wrath of the Almighty. In Ezekiel 23.32, God warns Jerusalem that She will soon be destroyed, just like Samaria was. And he says, you will drink your sister's cup, a cup large and deep. Psalm 75, 8 says, for a cup is in the hand of the Lord, and the wine foams. It is well mixed. And he pours out of this, surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its dregs. The wicked will be judged by the cup of God's wrath. Isaiah 51 verse 17 says, Rouse yourself, rouse yourself. Arise, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his anger, the chalice of reeling you have drained to the dregs. And then in Jeremiah 25, it says, For thus the Lord, the God of Israel, says to me, Take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And they shall drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Over and over again, we see the cup associated with God's wrath. And if we had time, we could go to many others, but this makes the point. The cup Jesus dreaded was the cup of divine wrath 
poured upon him as he bore our sin. This was not some kind of weakness in his character. To the contrary, it was a reflection of his perfect holiness. The cup was also the dread of even tasting sin. Folks, we do not understand his perfect hatred of sin. We do not understand what suffering it would be for the perfect holy son of God to taste sin for us. As those born in sin, we cannot fully understand that. But this is the reason why he abhorred this cup. For the first time, he would experience the filthiness and the putrid nature of sin. And we can only imagine the horror of having all the sins of all the world throughout all of history placed on him. So his prayer in the garden was the normal response of perfect holiness and one who had perfect hatred of sin. Now, he didn't drink this cup here in Gethsemane. That wouldn't happen until he was on the cross. The Bible says he himself bore our sins in his body, where? On the cross. On the cross. He's not drinking the cup here in the garden, but he knows it is coming, and he's asking his father if there is any other way that salvation can be won without drinking the cup. But note that there's never any question at all in regard to his doing the father's will. That is never in question. The only thing in question is whether there could be some other way. Jesus is absolutely committed to doing the will of the Father, whatever that may be. He wasn't seeking to avoid God's will. He was absolutely committed to that, but he was seeking to avoid this cup if that was possible. In Mark's gospel, we read that Jesus said, Abba, Papa, an intimate, endearing term, Father, all things are possible for you, pointing out to the uh, omnipotence of God. And then he says, remove this cup from me. He's saying, Father, in your omnipotence, I know nothing is, is impossible for you. Is there something else that can be done to atone for sin without having to drink this cup. And Luke only gives one phase of Jesus' prayer, but Matthew reveals it is really in three stages and that there's a progression of sorts in it. In Matthew 26, 39, he prayed, "'My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. In the second prayer, Jesus said, My Father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. So it moves from if it is possible to if it is not possible, but in either case, thy will be done. If there is any one constant throughout all the gospel accounts, it is that Jesus is fully committed to doing the will of the Father. Nowhere in this passage do we see any danger at all of Jesus forsaking the cross. And you know, many times preachers here in this passage will emphasize prayer. But as important as prayer is, that is not the primary point of this passage. It is the price that was paid by our Lord to atone 
for our sin. He was willing to drink that bitter cup for us. Well, we'd better move on. Notice, thirdly, the angel. Look with me at verse 43. Now, an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Now, there are a few older manuscripts that do not have this verse, but there are some very solid reasons why we should take this as part of the inspired record. And I don't have time to go through those this morning, but this verse is well attested and should be accepted at face value. Some have wondered how an angel could strengthen the Son of God, and many have debated that. But this is not the first time that we see this in Scripture. We're told, for example, that after Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, that the angels came and ministered to him. In that situation, after he had been fasting for 40 days, it is implied that he was given food for physical strength, and that very well may be the case here as well. We see this very same word in reference to Paul in the book of Acts after taking some food following a three-day fast. And it is evident that with Paul, it was physical strengthening from eating food. And in light of what we read next, it would make sense that the way the angel strengthened him was with some kind of physical sustenance. Now, we can't say for sure what the angel did, but we can say that in some way he strengthened him. In the midst of his prayer, there is divine restoration. Our Lord was supernatural, uh, supernaturally strengthened because he endured supernatural suffering. But the whole point of the coming of the angel was to reaffirm the Father's love and care and to say, in essence, there's no other way to atone for sin than to drink the bitter cup. If there was any other way, our Lord would not have gone to the cross. This prayer of our Lord in the garden confirms the New Testament truth that there is only one way of salvation. And that is through faith in the shed blood of the sinless Savior in atoning for sin. Fourthly, we see the agony. The agony. Look at verse 44. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Now, because the text says, like drops of blood, some scholars take this to mean that his sweat looked like drops of blood, but it wasn't really blood. However, I believe this should be taken literally. When Jesus said in Matthew 26, 38, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death, I think that meant literally. I don't believe that's merely an overstatement for effect. Jesus was literally near death at this point. And remember now, Luke was a doctor. And he tends to give certain medical details that the others might miss. I believe he's describing a condition known as hematidrosis where there is so much anguish that tiny capillaries in the sweat glands burst open causing the perspiration to literally be mixed with blood. And by the way, if this is the case, this is a very, very dangerous condition. It is usually fatal. And if not for the strengthening of the angel, it very well could be that Jesus could have died right here in the garden instead of going to the cross. But of course, that wasn't God's plan. 
The primary point of this verse is to show the deep agony of Christ as he anticipated the cup and to know that he did it all for us. His agony is beyond comprehension. What an incredible demonstration of his love for us. And it's interesting to note that the name Gethsemane means olive press. And just as olives were crushed beneath a huge stone to extract the oil, so our Lord was crushed under the weight of the anticipation of the bitter cup. And he sweat great drops of blood in his agony. Lastly, we see the admonition. Look at verse 45. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow and said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. He tells them the same thing he did at the beginning. They were in great danger and they needed to pray. Now, Luke is the only one of the synoptics that says the disciples were sleeping because of their sorrow. And again, in keeping with the fact that Luke was a doc doctor, he's really given a, giving a diagnosis here. The disciples are not sleeping because of the lateness of the hour or because it had been a busy week or because they're apathetic in some way. The Spirit of God, through the pen of Luke, informs us that the reality of Jesus' ultimate suffering has finally sunk into them, and they cannot handle it. So sleep is their way of dealing with it. And some have questioned this, but it has been demonstrated that severe grief and sorrow can cause extreme drowsiness. Now, Luke only has it one time, but the other synoptics tell us that Jesus found them sleeping three times. The last time, he tells them, in essence, that's enough. There's no more time for prayer. There's no more time to prepare. My betrayer is here. He's going to go and drink the cup. He's going to go and do the will of his father. Man of sorrows, what a name. For the son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a savior. The good news for sinners is that because Christ drank the cup, we don't have to. He drank the cup in our place. And all who put their faith and trust in Christ will never, ever have to face the wrath of God for their sins. On the other hand, those who reject Christ will still have to drink that cup of wrath. Those who face the wrath of God are those who have rejected God's substitute for sin. That is the main message of this passage of Scripture. And yes, it does teach us something about the importance of prayer, but especially that we submit to the will of God as we pray. Prayer is a powerful spiritual weapon with which we can stand against the temptations that we face. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such is as common to man that, and God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also that you may be able to endure it. And prayer is an important, powerful weapon to use in the face of temptation. What a promise that is from God. The only question is, will we appropriate it for ourselves? 
And just as it was with Christ and the apostles, God will not always remove the temptation, but he will give us the strength that we need as we face it. And he will provide the way of escape. What about you this morning? Where do you stand in regard to the cup? Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Do you know that you don't have to ever face that cup of God's wrath because Christ is your substitute? Or are you still without that assurance of salvation? Are you still someday going to have to face that cup of God's wrath? It all depends on what you have done with Jesus Christ. He is the the answer. He's the solution. He is God's provision, his substitute, the one who died in our place. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you would help us to understand the significance of this passage of Scripture. Lord, we pray that you would uh, help those who do not know Christ as Lord and Savior to understand that the wrath of God still remains. But there's a provision, a provision of your grace because Christ died on the cross as a substitute. And that if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we don't ever have to face that bitter cup of your wrath. And Lord, we are sinners, but we're sinners saved by grace. And Lord, I I pray that those of us who are believers, that we would understand the significance of what Christ has done for us and the depth of his love that caused him to drink the bitter cup. So Lord, we pray this morning we be faithful in all we do as we serve you. Lord, we ask that you would work in hearts and lives all over who hear this message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we encourage you, if you want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you have some kind of commitment that you need to make to the Lord, maybe some kind of decision to be a part of this church family or Uh, follow the Lord in baptism, whatever that might look like this morning, that uh, you would call the church office and uh, let us know about that so we'd have the opportunity uh, to minister to you. I'm going to ask Pastor Michael to come now and lead us as we sing.